is when I when I made that doc documentary, I I um I wasn't gonna release anything without at least talking to one member of each band. Um, you know, just just because what I didn't want to come back to me was, well, wait, why is our stuff on your record? You know, not on your record. Why is your stuff in your documentary? Blah blah blah. I wanted to be able to say, well, I spoke to this person and they were cool with it. So when I hit you up about the uniform choice stuff that I was, you know, just interested in using, you were like, use whatever you want, blah blah blah. Like I, I didn't expect that because I didn't know you, and I was right. expecting you to sort of come back with all these questions and all this stuff. Why were you always so nice to me? We didn't even know each other. <laughs> what, as I've gotten older, I've become a lot more aware of humility. And that doesn't mean that I'm not, um, uh, how can I put this? I'm not the same person. I'm not in an intense person. Uh, but stuff like I always viewed hardcore, and I still do now, and it's probably to my detriment. I've talked to Joe Nelson about it, and we laugh about it, but and Foster to some extent too, Joe Foster, is I don't view it as, I never viewed it as as a way to make a living or to make money or to do anything. To me, it was a privilege doing it. Doing Wishing Well was a privilege. I don't make any money off of things. I don't do that. I found later on that I was probably stupid to do that because people have made a lot of money off of the uniform choice and continue to do so but that that aside it's just I, I always thought it was uh a sharing thing right. you know, i was super happy with being a part a small little part of you know hardcore and uniform choice and uh unity and um the winds of promise that we do now all of that stuff is a pleasure and i want people to um if they're interested i wanted to to to, to have as many people listen to it as possible a lot of people like it. Some people don't. You know, that's okay. To me, it was a privilege to be a part of it, not um, something that I, I ever um, would ever want somebody to think that um, I was so selfish that it was about money. And it was never about that, and it never will be about that. Um, to me, it was a privilege to do it. Um, and that's how I always felt about it, um, and I always will. Well... I just, once again, when you and I, I mean, you probably remember this, when you and I first met, like the first thing I did was I just thanked you just because I was like, I just dealt with some stuff with that and with right. that movie. And you were just like, you know, just so awesome. And I was like, well, ah, I appreciate that's... it, man. And, and, and that's, that's how I feel. If you ever needed anything, if I can get it, you can have it. Well, I thank you for doing this because thank I've you. wanted to talk about staring into the sun with you for so long. And it's interesting how I came to this because, um, okay, I'm going to dial, dial back. 1985, 1986, and I made an animated movie about this, which I can get to you. Um, I um, had fallen in with like a really bad group of, well, not, not, not bad, but I fell in with some, with some people in middle school that were just a, different than any other people I'd ever been around. And one of the things that they were really into was punk rock and they're all great people we're still I'm still in touch with a lot of them to this day but um I I just knew that I was going down a different road than they were going to go down and and I needed to remove myself from that situation so when I left that middle school I had no plans and this was a middle school in Santa Ana right in Fountain Valley where we're near it um right around that time I heard from my brother um about there was a record I could get from Pure Records by a band called Uniform Choice, and I could buy it from the singer. And so I was like, oh, wow, I really want to do that. It was right before my bar mitzvah. I made my mom take me there. My mom took me there. I bought it off Pat. Um, anyway, where this, where this is going is I bought it, but I never listened to it, simply because I was like, I was like scared, like, okay, I'm going to start listening to this record. It's going to draw me back into that world, and I'm, and I'm going to continue. So anyway, years later... When I, you know, was old, was like, I think in 10th, 10th grade, I um, started listening again and, and got super duper into it. But rather than go right to Screaming for Change, I went to Staring into the Sun. And I, I think that may have even been by accident. Right. And, I, and, and I just, I remember hearing about that record and um, there was just a lot of talk like, oh, you know, they changed and this and that. But I remember listening to it going, wow, this is really 
fucking good. Like, like I like this, but I'm not supposed to because it's not the record that everyone's talking about. So where I'm going with this question is the that that new sound that that, that started. And I've written a bunch of questions, and I was going to put them in order. I'm like, screw it, just 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 you start. Ask me anything you want. I'll, I'll tell you the best of my ability. Awesome, awesome. Um, when that sound started. When did you notice, okay, wait, things are changing? Like, like, like at what point? Like, were you like, this is different? No, no, it, it, it we, uh, how can I put this? Uniform Choice had recorded Screaming for Change. And then, um, that was, uh, 1980, I want to say four or five. Not positive. Um, and then Pat Dyson was a drummer, great drummer, mm -hmm. was going to college. Um, he was going to Louisville to play football. So um, I knew all the guys in the band, obviously, and Pat and I were best friends. And um, we had decided that the best thing for us to do would be to uh, put out uh, – this, this is kind of leading up to your question. No, no, dude. Uh, I want it all. To put out, we wanted to do uh, a record label ourselves. Pat was in contact with Ian Mackay about possibly putting it on Discord originally. You know, just had conversations with him. I wasn't privy to them, but he, you know, we had talked to him and, and Ian had had really encouraged him to do it himself. Uh, try to figure it out yourself. This is what we do, and um, and so we said, why don't we? do our own record label. We have uniform choice. And this is prior to me entering the band. And, but why don't we do a single first? Um, and uh, that way we can kind of, we didn't know what we were doing. We had no idea, zero, nothing. Nowhere to get printed, get the money to get labels, how to do the artwork, do the, uh, and nothing like that. So we were going to do, we decided to do the unity. So, um, we did the unity and uh, it, that's for a different time. We did the single, we did it, we figured it out, we got ripped off, we did all this stuff, we didn't make any money. But for me, the quality of everything was exactly how we wanted to be. This is the first thing we were gonna do. So the second thing was gonna be Screaming for Change. Well, at that time then, they had recorded, the boys had recorded the songs and then Pat went to college. So um, I was up at UCLA, a freshman in my dorm, and um, Pat called me and goes, hey, we got a show in Riverside um, tonight. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I, I, what do you want me to do about it? Good luck with it. And, and he said, no, you, you got to play, you got to play drums. And then I was laughing and I'm like, well, my drums are at my, my parents' house in Orange County. I'm at UCLA. So they went, picked up my drums, picked me up from Westwood. We went to Riverside and on the way to Riverside, they paid, they played the demo. I, I knew, you know, I knew their songs, but just like as a fan, not, not as a drummer. And, um, so we played them over and over again. We had our set and, uh, that was the first show I played. So we thought, Pat and I thought, well, if, if you're going to be the drummer going forward at that particular time, which, you know, Vic and Dave also had a vote whether I was going to enter the band, but it, it kind of, it was a, a good fit at the time why don't we re-record a couple of songs with you on the album and then as the band the four of us we wrote scream for change and we wrote um once i cry now vic wrote the songs because rick is a guitar uh, uh, vic is a guitar player and dave playing bass pat and i did not play guitar so we would help by humming and ideas like that so that's how we made our songs right so we we re-recorded or we re recorded Scream for Change and A Wish and Dream. And then Pat, I said, hey, why don't you let me write the lyrics? Because I wrote most of the lyrics in some of the other things that we had done. And he goes, yeah, go ahead. So I wrote the lyrics for Screaming for Change and A Wish to Dream. We recorded it. We added it on to the album. Then we recorded it. Um, then we put it out on Wishing Well. So there was a, a, you know, we were together for quite a long time before then we went on tour in 1988 for Scream for Change, but we were already thinking about the next album. So we had been writing stuff all along during that time. 
in a kind of long-winded way to let you know where we got to. It wasn't something that we were going to, that, that we kind of just, um, this is what we are, this is how we're going to do our second album. It was, let's see if we can be a little bit more musical. You know, we could still play the, the old stuff, but let's try to, maybe we can do a couple of songs on the album that are a little bit more musical and maybe a little thought-provoking in the lyrics rather than straightforward hardcore. That doesn't mean that they were better or worse. I don't, you know, that's for other people to, to determine. That's just when you're 19, 20, 21 years old, you kind of want to change things up just a little bit. Right. But we were very, honestly, we we're very conscious too to do hard stuff. We did Cut of the Different Cause. We did I Am You Are. We did these types of songs. And if, Evan, I, I don't know if you ever saw us live. There was no, it was not, oh, geez, these guys are trying to be Def Leppard. There was, no, it was insanity. And that's how we wanted it live. We played everything way too fast. Um, so it was like that stuff on um, quite a bit faster and a lot harder. And without some of the effects that we were able to do and experiment with in the studio. For, for good or bad, I, we had never really been in a studio where we were the guys that were also the engineers. I mean, we were experimenting, trying to figure out what we were doing. Does this sound good? Does that not sound good? Should we do too many? Is that too many guitars? Is that too many overdubs on your vocals? You know, we were just a garage band, guys, really. And and that had played a bunch of shows and felt comfortable with each other. So it kind of went into that. It wasn't like, okay, geez, these guys are going to try to be uh, TSOL in that group. Not at all. It was just this is kind of how we feel right now. And quite honestly, if we probably did a third, if we had stayed together and done a third record, it probably would have been harder. Quite frankly, it would have probably been more like Scream for Change or the harder stuff on the band with a couple other ones mixed in. But, you know, in retrospect, that's wasn't, that wasn't to be. And I was just proud that we were able to get a couple albums out. You know, I, um, uh, spot edited. There's a, there was that release that Indecision Records did of both instead, like, I think all the instead records on vinyl. And um, there's a documentary that goes with that. And I did, like, some spot editing for Dave Mandel. And yeah. one of the things I had to do when I was doing that, Dave Dave just gave me the footage and said, look, I just need you to cut a story together because I don't, I'm, I'm too busy. I don't have time. I just want to be able to sit down with, like, something that's edited and then kind of work work with it. Well, one of the pieces that was in there was a really, really interesting interview with Pat Dubar. And one of the things that he said that really, really hit me um, was like, what, like, like, you know, when, when, when you guys did this and the way that people treated, treated you guys and like, you know, the, the word sellout is obviously thrown around. He said, I honestly feel we would have been bigger sellouts if we would have gone and just made the exact same record that we made the first time. And I want to know what are your sort of thoughts on that? Well, at the time, Pat and I were, were um, spot on in everything that we did because we were, again, we went to high school together. We went to college together. We were roommates in college. Um, we, th we thought and talked about these things a lot. So that's exactly what I would, uh, would, would say right now and I would have said back then. What would you want to do? Would you want us to do the same three chords? That's, I don't like that. Um, I like, I like when musical performers stick to who they are. I get that, but also try to, Hey, maybe there's something else in there that would be interesting as well. But, you know, we both got it. We both were big boys. We knew that there was going to be backlash and I, I don't want to say this arrogantly. And I don't think Pat meant it. He, he might've, um, but I don't think he did is, what the fuck you want us to do? You know, I, we I think that's exactly how he meant it. Took, uh, in, in my opinion, my humble opinion, took a lot more balls yep. to do what we did. Yep. It doesn't mean that it was better or worse. I'm not talking about the music. A lot more balls to do that than to do Screaming for Change too, Because everybody in the band was a bit burned out from that. Because they had been playing those songs for a number of years 
So it was interesting to say to Vic, come up with something, you know, that you like. That's a musical. I got something in my head. I'm going to hum it to you. What do you guys think of this it, during our rehearsals? That was more of a band collaboration. And by the way, Vic, Vic is not, would not, you wouldn't categorize Vic, Vic Maynes as your prototypical punker, skinhead punker. Absolutely not. First of all, he's five years older than us at the time. And neither was Dave. Dave loved TSOL and later joined TSOL, that kind of a poppy rock stuff. So it's not like they weren't in the scene. They were, but they were in the scene a hell of a lot earlier than we were. You know, that kind of a thing. So they're, their um, uh, their tastes in music were a lot more diverse than Minor Threat, Seven Seconds, Dag Nasty, um, Youth of Today, uh, and, and Slapshot. I could go on. Those those are stuff that Pat and I just died for. Well, they respected. Vic, of course, respected, and Dave did. But they were a little bit more. Um, they were more. I uh, wouldn't say mature, but they were. Their musical tastes tended towards a, a wider net throne. And uh, and that was, I appreciated that. And, uh, and, and and we got along, all of us got along fantastic. And we're okay with that second album. Again, I have to preference. It's not like we went to um, Geffen and everything was handed out to us. Everything that we did was on our dime. The money we made from t-shirts, um, some of the money that we made from concerts, that was for the recording. Giant didn't give us any money. You know, when we wanted it mastered, when, when Wishing Well mastered stuff at Capitol Records with Eddie, that was us. Pat and I scraped together money, gave them a call. Hey, listen, we want to do this. And they're like, what? You know, we're used to doing, you know, huge stars. But we were able to talk our way to do that, to get, a, you know, a, a little bit, a better mastering, obviously, than some guy's garage. And a little bit more like, hey, listen. You guys got your stuff mastered at, at Capitol Records. We set that up. But that's not a pat in the back. That's just we were trying to do the best product we could with the T-shirts and with um, with all of our recordings because it was from our heart. So, you know, you're going to get people that, uh, Evan, that, that don't like change. We knew that, and that's okay. I respect it. You know, I could go back and say I wish I had done this a little bit different and this and this and this. But I won't because I don't. I, well, don't I, I, I It wouldn't get where we are. I always remember, like, I'm going to say in early 90s when I was, like, doing a band. I was reading an interview with Pat, and he was in Mind Funk at the time. And he was talking about Uniform Choice, and he said, you know, we did this first record. It was really well received. And then, you know, we kind of wanted to just do things a little differently with this with this new record. And he's all, we were like pariahs. And, like, at the time... I was a young guy, and I liked the record. I, I, I liked both records, but I remember thinking at that time, and I think this is sort of the privilege of youth, I was sort of thinking at that time, well, yeah, you know, of course you guys were prized. You know, this is the hardcore scene. But it truly, it, like, what you guys ultimately did was really hardcore. Like, 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 like in, a, in, like, the best way. Like, it's about taking chances, and it's about, like, kind of, you know, like shaking, shaking things up. And I, I just, I think it's interesting now because I don't meet a lot of people. And when I talk to people now, I don't meet a lot of people that have anything negative to really say about that record. If anything, they really, really like that record now. So it's, I don't know. I, I, I find that interesting how it's become, I guess, what they would call a success D esteem. Sure. It's interesting. So you know a little bit that Uniform Choice's last show was 1989. Mm -hmm. We played at the Country Club with uh, Bad Religion and God, I forgot Toxic Reason, I think. And that was it. We were done. You know, Pat and I were graduating from school. Pat was going to was going to go to New York and do his thing with Mind Funk. It became Mind Funk, and that's what he wanted to do. And 100 percent. It was back to 100%. Dave wanted, I think Dave then, then did join uh, TSOL, um, if I'm not mistaken, for a while. And Vic was, uh, <laughs> Vic is like my father's great friend to this day. 
to this day, they talk and hang out and do stuff because my dad, um, Vic, when we went on tour, Vic is like, listen, I'm, I'm working at a heating and air conditioning place. I can't leave my job. And so I got him a job with my dad's sheet metal company, just as a guy sweeping up. And he stayed there and he's still at the same company. My dad is long retired. He's been there 35 years. So he and my dad are buddies. So I see, you know, I talked to Vic. We have boxing. Um, we both like boxing. So we have that in, in, in common together and as long and, and as well as you from Troy's. And his daughters were great athletes, softball, college softball players. Um, uh, my, my two boys play, play baseball as well. So we have that in common, but it's, it's really interesting how things, um, uh, evolved with, with, uh, within uniform choice and that when the winds of promise thing came up, um, with, with foster, I hadn't played drums in 30 years. So it's been a lot of fun. You know, I had to buy a drum set. I had to do all the stuff. I had to deal with Foster, which, you know. I, 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 oh, I, oh, I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. that, that's always King Dale is um, is uh, is a, a man amongst himself. Yep. Is, at least, which I, I love the kid. You know? <laughs> so because um, so, we were in unity together when we were both in high school. So, you know, we had that going. But it's been a lot of fun to catch up. My point is to catch up on 30 years of the scene as it evolved after 1989 to present day that I have I had no idea about zero, so I wasn't really interested in oh people didn't like you this and people don't like that or like this and whatever I had no idea. So it was super fun for me to be able to reconnect not only with the music which I loved and I loved playing the Winds of Promise stuff. You know we were able to play some shows. We went on tour in Europe. We had a ball with Bo Nelson and and Mike McKinnon. Just time of my life. I, I, I tell you, it's just a, so much fun playing and having a good time. But the interesting part is I didn't have any, um, there was very little of the negativity um, from people or blowback or whatever, because I, we, after 1989, I was done. Right. You know, I, I wasn't involved in it. Joe was in Ignite and they did, uh, uh, Nelson did Trigger Man and, and a bunch of other stuff and a bunch of great bands came of it who I've met subsequently um after which guys that that took the mantle and uh, uh, hardcore and straight edge and stuff forward i love that so it's a history of me that okay well what happened after 1989 so to me when we went to europe nelson told me he goes you're going to be kind of shocked that people really like uh, staring into the sun equally as much and some people more and i'm like you're kidding me <laughs> not not because i think it was inferior because you know i just it was really that yeah, because the, you know chamber chamber is, is such a novelty and, and is such a, a a cool thing for the scene at the time that this was something that was um, lukewarm at the time that was uh, you know uh, uh, how it was received so it's been really cool to have people come up and have me sign things or stuff like that. That's the, that, that's staring in the stun. I'm like, you know, kind of going, wow, that is pretty cool. Now, how did that record end up on giant, giant records? Like what was the, cause you're very good at breaking stuff down and like explaining things, which I don't know if you're aware of this, but in this whole Orange County hardcore scene star aftermath thing, it begins with you. Like, it literally, the first thing is you talking about Uniform Choice and NWA. Like, like literally, if you ever go to the YouTube thing, like, you started. So, how did you guys end up on Giant? Like, from a thing that you started on your own in the garage, talk to me. Well, we had done a number of bands. And, again, it's old, it's old stuff, which is okay continue to talk about some of the bands were like, geez, I wish I had got money. I wish I had done this. I wish I, well, you guys had been able to listen. We got the best product we could. I was in charge of, 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 um, artwork, getting everything right, getting the colors, getting stuff going back and forth from the typesetter. It wasn't on computers. Like now I had to take it physically to South LA, um, <laughs> To get it because we were at Pepperdine, I had to drive in my piece of shit car and go back and forth and find the mistakes and they'd have to redo them. All the typesets, all that stuff. 
is a lot of work. That doesn't mean that they shouldn't have been paid or whatever. But our thought was you're going to get a great product, something that you're not going to get ripped off on. And we're going to give you when you go on tour, because that was a big thing. We're going to go on tour. We need an album so we can sell it to make some money, which is good. You know, we sell for 10 bucks. We would give the bands records. Here, here's a whole shitload of records. This is you. This is for you. And my thought pattern was always the same. It's about the artwork for me. It isn't about dollars and cents. Call me naive. Call me stupid. I don't care. It didn't matter to me. That's what I thought. That's what I think now. You can have arguments with, with other touch and goes, the um, X claim, the discord. Okay. They kept with it. And it wasn't just Pat and I in high school and in college, you know, it was and with a shitload of other things to do rather than this. It, it was, we had a lives to run. So when giant approached us, and how'd they find out? Like, did they just uh, you know, call you? I, I, I don't remember. Honestly, I don't remember. But they were they were trying to get into the business, or were in the business, of, um, of hardcore. Um, I think they did Field Day, if I'm not mistaken. They did um, some, is it uh, government issue things? Whatever. They were in the business of trying to... I could be wrong with that, but I think... No, no. To, but weren't they a subsidiary of a major two or no? Yes. They were They were a subsidiary, as we found out later. It was hilarious. But I, I will say... I want to I wanna, I wanna hear it all, but no, continue. How, how can we get our message out to a larger audience with a company that has a marketing budget? Because we didn't. It's just Pat and I. Mm -hmm. We would put a couple of bucks together and maybe put something in um, Maximum Rock and Roll or a uh, flip side. Or what we did was, one of our marketing things was, every record that we do, we're going to get um, a little flyer of Wishing Well Records, one, you, you know, um, Unity, you are one. You can, you know, this is how much it is postpaid. Two, Screaming for Change, postpaid. And it was um, a P.O. box really, in Fountain Valley that Pat and I ran. Yeah, exactly. So we would do that, and that's our marketing thing. Everyone would have one of those in. we try to get stickers in, too, because Courtney, Pat's brother, was a, a genius at um, the, the um, uh, printing all of our Wishing Well stuff and doing stickers and all that stuff. So we tried to just throw stuff in there. That was our way of marketing. And it's hard, and it takes a lot of time and effort. And when it came, let's we, we look at it. I still remember... The contract, we were all of us were at Pat's mom and dad's house, and Pat's dad had a lawyer friend, if I remember correctly, and he looked over the uh, the contract, and Pat came back, and we all got went to his house, and he goes, he says, this is basically shit. He goes, this is garbage. You know, you're, you're going to be on the record label, but you're, like everybody says, you're at their mercy. And we all kind of took a, uh, a vote and it was basically for nothing. Like what else do we got to do? We want to do it. Maybe this will lead to something um, bigger or whatever, not bigger necessarily, but you know, okay, who cares? Let's do it. Well, That's and you could have always well. been on wishing well, you know what I mean? It was your thing. So you could have yeah. always done yeah, that. Yeah. We, we could do that, but I have to, I have to interject here that we were getting to the age Pat and I were, we were going to graduate college and then we have to make the decision about what we're going to do. And the decision was we're not going to do wishing well records full time to make money. That wasn't an option. I wasn't going to do it. And he, neither was he. Right. We weren't going to do that. So if that's not viable, we had to figure something else that we wanted to do if we wanted to do this record. And we thought that, you know, why not? Why not let somebody else do a bunch of the work and then we'll still control which we did. We controlled all the artwork and all of the content. They didn't care about that. They just wanted the name Uniform Choice, put the giant logo on the back of it, and see where it went. Oh, like I, I meant as far as being on Wishing Well, if things didn't work out. Like, it was always like... Oh, we, we would have just done it ourselves. Right, right. Yeah, we would have just done it ourselves. Right. But um, there, wasn't a, there weren't any other viable options, really. Still, there weren't. I mean... You know, Posh Boys, something like that. We weren't going to do that because we had already done our own things. Did they push the record well, or was it something that 
they released, and then it was, well, let's see what happens, kind of, kind yeah, of thing. You know, I, I think that they did the best. Um, it wasn't going to be, they weren't going to put a whole shitload of money into any of these bands. Mm. Just if something hit, then they already controlled it with the next record and the next record. You know, so they it was a way of taking a bunch of darts, throwing them on the dartboard, and if something sticks, then they can make some money off it. And As we said, found out later, they were pieces of shit. And um, they're lucky. They're, the one guy is lucky that his teeth are still in his mouth when we were on tour in 1989 and we went to New York because we wanted money. It, you know, we know that it's selling. And uh, I remember the day we're in the downtown New York and Pat's on a, on a, uh, <laughs> we're on a phone booth. And the guy got the guy on the phone and he, and he, he didn't know we were on tour. He's like, hey, we're, uh, we want our money, blah, 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 blah. He's giving us a bunch of runaround, right? He goes, he goes, motherfucker, I'm in New York. I'm about eight blocks away. We're coming now. So he shit his pants. All the security people were on the outside of the big building, right? And it was hilarious, you know, <laughs> because we knew at that time that, like many other artists, we were going to take it. We're going to just take it. And there's nothing we could really do because we didn't, I mean, it's not like my dad or anybody – um, was a um, a lawyer that the, they could do a pro bono and stick it to him. Right. It just wasn't going to happen. That was a, really a sick feeling too to know that that um, and one of the disadvantages of of letting the um, power go from uh, not running things at wishing well for good or bad we ran it. So the only people to pat on the back would be ourselves or if people kicked us in the ass. It, there's just only two people to do it, and it was Pat and I, and that was okay. Because we at least tried to do everything full speed and to the benefit of the bands um, that we were doing because we cared about them. Um, whereas you find out with a slap in the face that they didn't give a shit about us at all. And so that's is, a, is something to swallow is tough. A few bands later, Carry Nation took the stage. Shortly after that, Judge, a band from New York, took the stage. Andrew and I left a few songs into their set. As I was leaving, Nelson introduced me to Greg Brown, Scott Sundahl, Paul T, and other members of a group known as the Orange County Sloth Crew. Eventually, they would nickname me Mushnik, which was a character I had been in a high school play. On the ride home, I had no idea that those people I had just met would become and would be the gateway to the best friends I would ever have.